Anish Bogimish, Kaji Kastini, Don Ira Aragadish. I now call Robbie Butler to ask the first question of the Finance Minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number one, please. I can see you, Mr. Naira Aragadish. I call the Finance Minister. With your permission, I uh, wish to group questions 1, 9 and 14. Mm -hmm. I, along with my executive colleagues, are committed to the ensuring the delivery of the Victims Payment Scheme. With that in mind, as part of the draft budget, the executive has allocated some £6.7 million towards the preparation costs for the introduction of the scheme. The wider payments issue requires urgent attention. While TEO did identify estimated costs in respect of scheme payments, the executive was agreed on the need to further the matter of funding with the Secretary of State whose predecessor's actions led to a significant increase in the potential cost of the scheme. The first, Deputy First Minister, the Minister for Justice and myself have been trying to meet with the Secretary of State for some time. He has now agreed to a meeting which is due to take place tomorrow. Robbie Butler for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer. Could the Minister outline what those uh, likely funding levels might be, uh, any estimates that he has made for the Troubles Permanent Disabled Payment Scheme, and what bids, if any, the TU or the Justice Ministry have given to his office? Well, the uh, most recent report we got from the Government Actuary Department uh, estimated the cost of anything between £600 million and £1.2 billion, which is an increase on the previous estimate, high-level estimate that the Department for Justice had, had placed on this. Uh, and of course, as he will know, the additional bits of that scheme which were added in by the previous Secretary of State, including uh, psychological in injury, including injury to people based outside the jurisdiction, including uh, injuries and psychological injuries for uh, armed forces personnel, uh, all have sub very substantially increased the potential cost of the scheme. And while it's a demand-led scheme, it's very hard to give an accurate uh, uh, estimation, but Clearly, those costs, uh, I, I think, make it hugely challenging, uh, if not an unaffordable, for an executive to, uh, to, bur to carry this burden alone, uh, not to mention the fact that it is contrary to the British government's own policy, having set the policy and legislated for it. The, of course, the Department of Justice received money to, for the administration of the scheme, and the executive are very clear that, in terms of the payments for the victims, which we wish to see happen and we are very committed to see happening, we need that discussion urgently, and that is why we have been pressing since last year for a discussion with the Secretary of State to try and apportion the costs of the, the actual scheme itself. Mr Thomas Buchanan for support. Thank you, um, uh, Deputy Speaker. And I know the Minister has, has touched on this, but um, uh, given that the, uh, on the wider cost of the scheme, which the Minister has talked about running from £600 million onward, can the Minister um, advise the House as to what action he has taken to ensure that whenever the application process is made by the innocent victims, that the money will be there to, uh, to make the payment to them and there will be no further delays in this particular scheme? Well, of course, it is a matter for the executive to decide. Uh, and if the executive decides it is going to carry the burden of the entirety of the cost, then the upward figure, as I say, is estimated by the Government Actuary Department at £1.2 billion. That will have a, a serious knock-on implication for other public services that we provide uh, over uh, the course of the lifetime of the scheme. And there may well be uh, much more upfront costs attached to that than were previously estimated, uh, given that people may opt uh, for a lump sum pension rather than uh, a, a lump sum rather than a pension over many years. So all of these issues uh, create huge levels of uncertainty, and that's why we need that discussion with the British government. Uh, the Secretary of State has decided to take the lead in relation to this, and we have been pressed for a discussion with them because we want and we wanted to include uh, the, the payment levels in this in the draft budget paper that we have produced and we certainly want to produce uh, the levels for payment in the final budget paper that we will come to in the next couple of weeks. Just to outline at the beginning, I think that it's disgraceful that the British Secretary of State has taken five months to respond to a request for a meeting on this issue, something, a policy and legislation that he brought forward himself and took five months to meet with ministers from this executive. Having said that, I am glad that he is now prepared to meet with you. Minister, can you outline what the potential impact will be for other departments? And I would like to outline that I absolutely support these payments being paid to victims. Victims should not have to wait any longer. But what is the likely impact if the British Government do not step up to the plate in relation to funding this? Well, as I say, it depends uh, on the level of cost. We're turning between 600 million and 1.2 billion, depending on uh, how upfront 
so people seek payments so that could change the profile in terms of year on year. But if you took it at the upper level and, and, and did a rough allocation across departments, you were talking about Department of Health, uh, about £615 million, Department of Education, of £227 million, uh, and, and so on, right down the level of spending for all departments. So you can see it would be a very significant impact on our public services. That's not to play off victims and what they deserve and need against uh, public services, because that would be a very cruel thing of the government to try and do on us. Uh, who want to provide the best possible public services, but also meet the, the very real requirements uh, of victims. Uh, and that's why we need that urgent discussion with the Secretary of State. We need this issue resolved. Mr Jim Allister, for a question. Is it not exactly what the Minister is doing, trying to play all victims against the public service in order to up the ante with the Secretary of State? Uh, and is there an acceptance that at the end of the day, there is no choice when one listens to the Court of Appeal other than this money to be found wherever it is found. And does it help by exaggerating the demands by saying, for example, £600 million of the Department of Health as if that was in one year, when that is over the entire lifetime of the scheme, which might be 30 years? Well, uh, Mr. Las Concorda, the, the member says the money should be found wherever it's found. It clearly doesn't indicate where it should be found, so he has not come off the fence. Perhaps he could say if he thinks the executive should pay for this in its entirety, that the British government shouldn't make any contribution. And if he feels the British government should make a contribution, then we are right in the executive to try and pursue them over that contribution to it. So he's sitting on the fence because he has not declared his hand. He's just saying somebody should sort this. It shouldn't go on much longer. Somebody should sort it. But of course, from his position in opposition, he doesn't have to come up with the answers for any of that. We are trying to sort it. We recognise that the costs over the 30 years, and that's the, the, the costs that I've attributed, uh, that the Government Actuary Department have come up with, not us, but the Government Actuary Department. And if we have to pay those, that will have a huge impact. And I have no desire to play off public services against the needs of victims. What we want to see is this issue resolved. But the British Government added the substantial costs to this policy. Therefore, they have a duty to meet those costs. With your permission, uh, last concord, I wish to group question 2 and question 12 together. I have put forward a proposal to the Executive for establishing both the Fiscal Council and the Fiscal Commission. These include terms of reference and membership of both bodies. Once the Executive has considered these proposals, I hope we will be able to put both Council and Commission in place very quickly so that they can begin their important work. I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, Minister, as I understand it, the Fiscal Council will focus on the Executive's spending uh, plans but not its uh, revenue plans. Do you agree that the work of the Fiscal Council will be more meaningful if the Executive uh, assumes greater control over local taxation and revenue raising opportunities as a result of the important uh, work the Fiscal Commission will take forward? Well, I thank the member for the question. Yes, it's, it's, the intention is that the Fiscal Commission will look at uh, uh, that broad range, as it do, has been done in both Scotland and Wales on a number of occasions, uh, the range of uh, economic uh, policy and revenue raising uh, levers available to the executive and make some recommendations. It is envisaged that the, the Commission would uh, engage over the the rest of this calendar year and produce a report for the executive, which would more than likely, given the time frame we're in and the mandate, become the property uh, or uh, a point of action, if you like, for an incoming executive. Uh, and so clearly, when it has its work done and any decisions taken by the executive will then be become a matter of, of immediate interest to a fiscal council. Uh, so I see very much the work of both bodies being interlinked in that regard. Mayor Matthew Tool, for your case, to call Matthew Tool. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I welcome the fact these bodies are being instituted. I have been calling repeatedly for them, so I am glad they are. But can I ask the Minister for some specific details? Will, for example, either the Fiscal Council or the Fiscal Commission be uh, set up in statute and legislation, giving it the grounding that, for example, the OBR has in London, indeed the Fiscal Advisory Council in the Republic? Will they also have independent economic forecasting powers, which will give real bite and insight into their recommendations uh, and, and really um, uh, underline their independence? Well, the propositions I have brought for the Fiscal Council are very much an initial proposition to set the Council up. 
Uh, of course, the experience in other jurisdictions, he said, is that once it's been set up, they have moved on to a legislative footing, uh, and that indeed is something that I, I would imagine both ourselves and indeed the committee which he sits on would have an interest. Uh, and we would want and have asked uh, the, the personnel involved in both Fiscal Council and Commission to engage early uh, with stakeholders, including uh, the Finance Committee. Uh, and clearly, we would want to see that. We would want to see the uh, independence of it very firmly established, and whatever resource it believes as it begins its work is needed for it. There will be a resource provided from the Department uh, and support provided from there and, and uh, uh, senior officials in the Department to support both uh, Council and Commission plus the Secretariat uh, for both as well. Uh, but should they require any other resources or levels of support, we're very happy to look at that. But the, the initial proposition is to get these bodies up and established uh, and allow them to develop from there. My apologies, you should have called Chris Little first there, but Mr Little, you have the floor now. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Fiscal Council was a commitment um, set forward in the new decade, new approach uh, agreement in January 2020. So can I ask the Finance Minister when the Fiscal Council will be operational, how it will be funded and what its relationship with the Finance Department will be? Well, the, uh, the Council will be operational as soon as the Executive approves it, uh, which I would hope be in, within in a matter of days. Uh, its relationship with the Department is, is that we, the costs will be met by the Department of Finance, uh, and we have already budgeted for that. And we will provide a secretariat and, and, and senior support in terms of a senior official of the Department. Uh, and then the, clearly the intent then is for the Commission, as other commissions, similar commissions did, uh, to move themselves onto a, a more solid footing in terms of legislative underpinning. Uh, and then uh, we will work with them if they have a specific other requirements that they feel are necessary, then we're very happy uh, to work with them. And of course, we have encouraged them to engage with all stakeholders uh, as soon as they get up and running. Call Steve Aiken. Um, indeed, thank you very much, Ian. Thank you, for the Minister, for his remarks so far. Obviously, with the Fiscal Council, we would wish it to be put on a legislative and uh, framework and so that it's on statute to guarantee its independence as quickly as possible. But could the Minister outline what relationship he sees it developing, particularly with items such as the Procurement Board that he's now Chair of, and indeed the independent board that's being set up on infrastructure and other independent oversight boards that are being looked at? Well, I, uh, firstly, I agree with him in terms of moving quickly to that uh, position, and we have spoken together uh, around this uh, in recent days. Uh, and I, I see a role for the committee, of course, in relation to to that. Uh, the, the Fiscal Council, of course, will have a responsibility for looking over the executive's finances uh, for making sure we are on a sustainable footing. And therefore, things like the Procurement Board, which, which provide policy for a spending of £3 billion, would be an important function, which I am sure there will be an interaction with. And any of the other agencies, I think, which impact our bodies, uh, which impact in terms of our, our give advice in terms of spending, are something that I am sure its remit uh, would have an interest in. So we do fully expect the Council, when it's up and working, to have a wide engagement, uh, both with outside of government bodies that have an interest, but also inside this institution and the government departments and the various arms and bodies as well. Call Michelle McElveen for a question. Question three, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the responsibility for airports rests with the infrastructure minister, and while the responsibility for our connectivity and indeed wider economic support, including the COVID, business, uh, COVID restrictions business support scheme to support businesses in the supply chains of effective businesses, rests with the economy minister. My department is in the process of implementing a £10 million package of support for the Belfast airports under the emergency powers granted by the first and deputy first ministers. The infrastructure minister is providing 1.2 million of similar executive support to the city of Derry Airport. Keeping the airports open is the first step to supporting the businesses that work with them. Uh, this support fo also follows on from a series of executive agreed announcements last year specifically to help sustain the aviation sector during the pandemic, including over £3.1 million in direct business rate support to airports and other businesses within the airport sites. My department is also holding £150 million aside for consideration of additional business rates relief in the next financial year. Regional airports will be considered as part of that. And this, in turn, is in addition to a broader range of schemes that have been put in place by the Executive and Treasury to provide significant support to businesses more generally. If respective ministers believe there are gaps in provision of support for the industries they have responsibility for, then I will fully consider any proposals they develop. Michelle McAveen for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Obviously, the, the huge drop in revenue as a result of fewer flights has caused devastating losses to other industries, such as um, 
engineers, travel agents, airport car parks and taxi operators. What is the Minister and his department um, doing to assist other ministers perhaps in preparing a package of measures to support those businesses specifically? Well, what we've been doing, uh, I suppose, almost like a crack record for the last number of weeks, is encouraging ministers to bring forward bids uh, for any area of responsibility or any sector that falls under their broad uh, ambit of their department uh, to try. And it's in recognition that some of the sectors that she mentions have thus far not received any support, or some uh, very little. The support we provided to the airports did cover the businesses within the airport itself uh, and give rate relief there and, uh, and other support to them. And of course, as I said, the, in the first instance, keeping the airports open uh, and being able to pick up again whenever we emerge from this pandemic uh, is going to be crucial. Uh, but if there are other sectors, and I know in some cases some of them, there have been bids brought forward for the taxi industry. Uh, I'm told that there may well be support uh, being sought in relation to travel agents, which I very much welcome. Uh, uh, but it really is for other departments who have responsibility for those sectors to bring bids forward. Uh, Jerry Carroll, on your question. I call Jerry Carroll for a question. Question four, please. Construction and procurement delivery (CPD) in conjunction with the Civil Service Human Rights or, uh, Human Resources sorry, uh, have completed a procurement to provide agency workers for a wide variety of posts within the civil services and the agencies and non-departmental public bodies. Within that procurement, a total of eight contracts were awarded. The estimated total value of all contracts being £425 million. The use of, con of the contract is demand-driven, and therefore the figures provided are estimates rather than a guaranteed level of business. Like many organisations, the civil service uses agency workers to carry out work for a variety of reasons which cannot be completed by substantive civil service staff. This includes covering periods of staff absence or to support time-limited projects or contractual work, or, where necessary, to cover permanent vacancies pending substantive appointments. Approximately 50 per cent of agency workers in the civil service are assigned to the Department for Communities to discharge benefit processing services on behalf of the Department for Work and Pensions under the terms of service level agreements. The salary costs of all those staff are funded by DWP via the Department of Communities. Of the eight contracts, six were awarded to Premier Employment Group Limited. The total estimated value of the Premier Employment Group Limited contracts is £394 million. Jerry Carl. Supplementary question for Jerry Carl. Thank you, Minister, for his answer. And you'll be aware, obviously, of previous uh, contracts with agency uh, firms. There have been a, a big overspend, and I appreciate he mentioned estimates, but I hope he can outline measures that are put in place to avoid overspends again. But given the fact that the controller and auditor general has expressed his concern that there is an over reliance on agency staff, and that I quote, strong evidence therefore exists that temporary solutions are being used to plug permanent gaps. It appears the Minister's decision is at odds with this uh, position. How can he commit to both addressing the reliance and over reliance on agency workers by announcing another lucrative contract for further use of agency workers? Thank you. Well, can I say there will be oversight and monitoring of the contracts to make sure that they are uh, properly uh, operated and, and, and the, the payments reflect the uh, service that has been provided. Uh, recruitment, which you know is, a, is not a, an overnight process, uh, is ongoing to fill permanent vacant posts. The majority of agency workers are administrative officer AO level. And as, the 15, as of the 15th of February, there were 1,749 agency workers at this grade in the civil service. A recent AO external competition that allowed current agency workers within the civil service to apply has resulted in over 560 letters of offer being issued to date. So there is an attempt to reduce reliance on that to, uh, to, to, increase, but, uh, to increase more permanent staff. But as I have said, 50% uh, of the, the agency workers that are used are directly through the DWP contract. Uh, which is a service level agreement they have with the Department for Communities. But uh, I agree with them, and we have enhanced the terms and conditions this year of agency workers. And uh, to, the, the best solution is uh, where it can be found permanent workers with uh, no, proper terms and conditions and career prospects that it that allows. Question, Jim May I get last, Karen Corley, and I thank the Minister for his answers. And Minister, I very much welcome the fact that you have required parity of treatment between agency and permanent workers in terms of pay, annual leave and paid time off for medical appointments. In addition to these improvements in, in conditions, has your department included any social clauses in the contract? Yes, well, as, as the member said, we have, we have changed uh, the, the terms and conditions to allow uh, similar uh, 
party with our party with the uh, issues that apply to civil service workers themselves. Uh, in, consult in consultation with the SIB, the Department has used the Buy Social initiative to include a number of social clauses in the new contracts. The contractor will deliver paid work placements for Buy Social agency workers and the business and education initiatives to uh, a school or an organisation within the voluntary community and social enterprise sector to support people's career development and employability. This support may include vocational talks, curriculum support, career guidance, workplace visits or mentoring. The contractor is also required to develop and maintain a human rights policy in relation to work carried out on this contract. Mark Durkin. Mark Durkin for question. A few months ago, the Minister assured me here that the necessary resources were in place to support the recruitment, the recruitment of the announced 900 Northern Ireland civil service posts in universal credit over the next few years, given the 126 per cent increase in the number of claims, a number that is sadly inevitably going to increase even further. Now, it's my understanding 350 of these posts were advertised, yet to date, not one of them have been filled, and the DFC draft budget indicates no additional money for recruitment next year. Does the Minister agree with me that this investment is vital to not only to minimise the hardship faced by claimants, but also to reduce the massive stress on current staff? Well, can I say I do agree with them in the latter points. Uh, where I disagree with them is the, the guarantee that I say to give many finance minister, which guarantees you what money is going to be in next year's budget, uh, is somebody that you should listen very carefully to. Uh, so I, I couldn't give any such guarantee last year because we didn't know what was going to be in next year's budget, and what we have been delivered at very late and short notice from the Treasury is uh, essentially a flat budget for next year, which for a department such as communities uh, to have the same cash available as they had last year. Uh, is effectively a, a cut. Uh, and I have had a number of meetings with the Minister for Communities. Uh, she's very correctly identified the pressures that he, he, he refers to, uh, and she very clearly is exercised to uh, ensure that she can employ the uh, requisite number of staff to deal with an uh, unfortunately very high level increase uh, in the number of people presenting to claim universal uh, credit. So we will work very closely with her, and we hope to have an improved position by the time we get to the final budget stage. Andrew Muir for a question. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we have all been greatly indebted for the work of our civil servants and officials uh, in very challenging circumstances, particularly from the Department of the Economy in terms of the assistance that they have given. We were recently reported there is a 25 per cent vacancy rate within the Department of the Economy. Is the minister, can the Minister give us assurance that everything is being done to fill those vacancies so that we can relieve the pressure upon the staff within that department? Well, of course, we will do all we can to support departments when they identify uh, the pressures. There were £1.7 billion worth of the pressures identified just ahead of the budget. The budget didn't deliver any additional cash, so that's a very significant uh, level of pressure to try and meet within existing resources. But of course, we, we will uh, and we will continue to work uh, with all departments to try and assist them in managing the pressures that they face, including the pressures of recruitment. Call George Robinson for a question. Question five, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The member will know we are currently in the middle of a pandemic and any future economic assessments will depend on the course and nature of the pandemic, the vaccination response and the potential for virus uh, mutation. At this stage, it is not possible to accurately predict the medium to long term implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. How the pandemic impacts on the executive's budget will depend on a number of factors, the primary one being the approach that the British Government take to public spending in the medium to long term. We will know more once work commences on a further spending review, which will set out the medium, budget, uh, medium term budget envelope. Mr. Robinson, for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. And does the Minister foresee an impact on the capital spend from the executive due to the COVID 19 pandemic, which could have a detrimental impact on departments such as economy, health, etc.? Well, it, it very much depends. Uh, we have this year's budget, which is very disappointing, including the capital allocations and, and the resource allocations, because we, in effect, get the same amount as last year, given that costs rise, uh, salary costs rise, 
then you, uh, most of those larger departments are in effect having to cut uh, to their budgets. So that is very disappointing. Uh, it will very much depend on what policy approach the British Government takes. If it reverts back to the approach it took to the 2008 crash, for instance, which it decided to cut public spending to introduce austerity policies, then we're into a real difficulty, because I don't think we've ever fully recovered from the austerity policies and the cuts that were imposed in budgets over a number of years. Last year's budget was the first one which gave all departments an uplift, and now this year's budget we're back to flat cash again. So it will very much depend on that going forward, but as he correctly identified, if there is a reduction in capital, then it will have an ongoing impact in terms of uh, how some of those bigger departments can spend out their money. Uh, Dig, Philip Wigan. Question for Philip. Gara Melgard, uh, last can call you. Uh, this disappointing standstill budget provided to the executive for next year seems to indicate that the British government intends to use COVID uh, to justify a return to austerity, just as it did. Uh, in the financial crisis of 2008. Can I ask the Minister uh, if he agrees with me that austerity is a self-defeating right-wing ideology that will hamper economic recovery from the current health pandemic? Well, I think it's the wrong approach. Uh, I mean, if, if ever we saw a lesson for the short-sightedness, I think, of cutting public services, it was the advent of the pandemic itself, uh, when public services became hugely crucial. Uh, the health service in particular, but a whole range of public services that have been underfunded for many years. Uh, and, and the direct knock-on effect of that is that the restrictions that we find ourselves in place, which have an impact on the economic activity, are a consequence of trying to protect public services. Uh, to make sure the health service isn't overwhelmed. So there is a linkage between the two, uh, and it, it, it is a short-sighted policy, policy, short policy because it does impact uh, on longer-term economic planning and economic spend. So I would hope that it's not a direction the British government revert to. I hope they will have learned a lesson that the last uh, dalliance with uh, austerity policies did not serve uh, the public uh, generally well, and I, I hope that that's not a course they follow in the future. Alan Chambers for a question. I thank the Minister for his answers uh, thus far. Uh, Minister, uh, can you make a commitment to ensure that the sacrifices of our health service are recognised and that health transformation will remain the priority in funding going forward? Thank you. Yes, well, I know that that is a key ask of the Health Department. Of course, from my previous answers, we have recognised that the health service was left under enormous pressure. But the Executive when it returned last January, it set itself a priority of, of uh, collectively uh, trying to support the health service and that health transformation, uh, and that remains executive policy. So, uh, even though we have limited resources, he will know that health does get the lion's share. Then they tend to get the first call, and any additional resources we get, and that's as needed because we have seen, uh, if we needed that example over the course of this pandemic, how crucial and vital. Uh, the health service is to protect our population. So, of course, uh, I would wish that we had a much better budget to offer them next year, but we will certainly try and protect that transformation as best we can in the time ahead. I think we'll be able to get a quick question and answer on Aram Sir Cara Hunter, Lida Hull. I called Cara Hunter for. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Number six, please. The Gordon Market Last Concord, uh, I would like to group questions 6, 8 and 11, though I doubt we will uh, get to 8 or 11 uh, in terms of response. But during the uh, January Monitoring Round, Minister Weir uh, submitted a bid for £3 million for children's portable devices for the Education Authority. The bid was agreed by the Executive on the 21st of January 2021. The Department for Infrastructure did not submit any bid in the January Monitoring Round to maintain and improve rural roads. Uh, and for an answer to the member's question, having provided further additional resources on the 2nd of February and the 10th of February, subsequent to the January monitor round, I have now asked the Executive Minister to provide final bids for funding in 2020-21. These are currently under consideration, and I will update the Assembly in due course. Brief supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, I'm mindful of the concerns uh, of those waiting in limbo for cancer surgeries across the north, and I'm sure you two share uh, my concern. Therefore, can I ask the Minister, has your department made any further funding available for private health care providers to enable more cancer surgeries to take place? Thank you. Uh, well, this was a conversation that was had uh, a number of weeks back at the Executive, and we were advised by the Health Department that they couldn't purchase uh, surgery in this year to be spent out in the next financial year. So uh, the allocation of, of some unspent uh, COVID money uh, wouldn't have worked in that regard. Uh, I, I understand and appreciate the points that she's making, although uh, purchasing surgery abroad might be uh, 
problematic anyway in this pandemic and the restrictions on travel. Uh, but we were advised that, uh, because it was discussed, uh, that uh, a surgery purchase now could not be spent out in the next financial year, so it wasn't possible to allocate money to that. There was no bid to come in for it in that regard. Either. Members, that ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr Mike Nesbitt. Speaker, grateful if the Minister could inform the House of um, the quantum of funds currently at risk of being unspent and therefore lost to the Treasury. Well, I, I, well we're still receiving uh, information from departments, uh, so we can't. Uh, suffice to say, uh, we do intend to bring an updated paper this Thursday to the Executive. Uh, which I hope will capture all that we have received to date, plus if we have left a little bit of leeway if anybody has something in the pipeline that they want to bring to our attention, because my priority is to try and make sure that all of the sectors that have missed out uh, get an opportunity to have a case made for them. Uh, but we also put in place contingency plans, which we will then bring to the Executive to spend out any remaining money to ensure uh, that the, the full value of that goes back into the local economy or local services. Mr Nesbitt, for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister. Has the Minister received a bid from the Minister uh, for Justice on behalf of the Police Service of Northern Ireland, bearing in mind the Chief Constable's warning uh, that he may have to lose uh, several hundred officers, which would amount to a net loss of 800 officers compared to the commitment of New Decade, New Approach? Well, I think there is a difference in, in what he's talking about in terms of making a bid. The bids that I have been speaking about are bids for unspent COVID money, which was the, the, the parameters, or if you like, the, the framework of his original question. Uh, if, if, if he's then moving on to the budget next year, uh, because w the first question dealt with unspent money or underspent of money, that, that of course has to be spent in this financial year. If he's moving on to the budget next year, then of course, as I had said in response to previous questions, we didn't receive any increase for any department. Uh, so any uh, bids or pressures identified by the Department of Justice or indeed any other department uh, have to be set against that reality is that we have had no additional money for any department. We had no time to do a reprioritisation exercise, which may have taken money off one department and put it into another priority in another department. And so that left us with a very uh, difficult position to try and match for the year ahead. And of course, pressures in relation to policing uh, personnel come in under that as well. I call Mr. Robin Newton for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the uh, Finance Minister for his answers uh, so far. Uh, the Minister will be aware of the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, and indeed their code of practice and their established rules. And that indeed is embedded within the Treasury's improving spending control guidance. Would the Minister agree with me that the devolved, where they were states within the Treasuries, devolved administrations and their arm's length bodies will be required to monitor and manage information about spending more efficiently and improve the skills needed to deliver their spending plans? Would the Minister agree with me that that is a good foundation for fiscal management? Yes, I think it is, and that's why we included uh, reference to the best practice in the OECD and the setting up in terms of reference uh, of the Fiscal Council, uh, whose uh, proposition around which I have put to the Executive. Supplementary for Mr Newton. I thank you, Mr Spe Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer, short though it is. Uh, Minister, would you agree then that the DECAL sub-regional stadia programme that was agreed by the Executive as a priority in which it was allocated £36 million back in 2011, on which a consultation started in November 2015, closed in February 2016, and then for some reason the Minister went out to a second consultation. We are now in February 21. No money has been allocated to the, the, the football clubs. Would the Minister agree with me that this does not meet the OECD established rules of good practice. Well, I think uh, what he also maybe neglects to mention is that we had a three-year hiatus when the Assembly was down uh, in the middle of all of that, uh, and so and the Department uh, for Culture, Art and Leisure has now gone and been replaced by the Department of Communities, who have responsibility uh, for this programme. So uh, I, I think it's a matter, obviously, that the Communities Minister could answer to, perhaps not for her predecessors, as to what happened there, but certainly as to what is intended to happen uh, to that programme uh, into the near future. Uh, and and I, I agree with him that we, we want to see things work 
work as efficiently as they can. And I also would share his, his view that investment in sports is a very good long-term investment for society as a whole. I'm sorry, Cara Hunter for your case. I call Cara Hunter for question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And again, I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, my topical today refers to education. Can I ask the Minister, will he allocate extra resources for schools by extending the Engage programme uh, for another year and the provision of expanded IT support for schools and IT equipment for all children who do not have adequate IT at home for schooling? Thank you. Well, I, I, I I agree with her entirely that that's been a very, two very important uh, programmes that the Department for Education have run, and we have given money and, and recently in, uh, increased the money that we've given to uh, engage uh, programme, and also, uh, as I said in the previous answer, I think three million pounds for additional uh, support for IT requirements for kids who are homeschooling. There will be COVID money available next year, not on the same level as we have had this year, where we were over 3.3 billion. I think we're, we're promised about half a billion next year. Some of that is earmarked for education, and I would imagine, because I know the Education Minister is uh, uh, very complimentary about the Engage scheme in particular and the value it has been, so I will imagine that he will be bidding for support on those grounds. I'd be very happy to support those bids. Okay, Storlinta, Cara Hunter, supplementary question for Cara Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer. Um, given East Derry is such a rural constituency, I hear often about the difficulties with uh, broadband uh, and uh, digital poverty. So I'm just wondering what further steps are being taken by your department uh, to remedy this. Thank you. Well, uh, I mean, I, I recognise the problems. I represent South Armagh, which has very similar issues in terms of broadband con connectivity and rural uh, poverty and deprivation. Uh, I know my own department have been uh, involved in a, if you like, a pilot scheme in terms of IT support for people, vulnerable people in, in areas who are struggling to get that connectivity, and it's been substantially oversubscribed. So we intend to look again at what resource uh, we can apply to that. Uh, and of course, I would encourage the education department as well to be looking at particular uh, in, in rural areas that do have difficulties because homeschooling is difficult enough uh, for parents who have full access to broadband, but where that is patchy or non-existent, then it's, ne it's virtually impossible for people. Rosemary Barton for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker and Minister. Thank you for your answers so far. Minister, what should have been an automatic payment of winter fuel allowance this year, to take, which was to take place in November and December, appears to have been quite problematic in a number of areas. Can you explain the steps the department are taking to resolve the issues so that there won't be a repeat of it next year? It, I seem to be answering questions on a lot of depart other departments' business uh, today as part of my topic, and that clearly is a Department for Communities issue. Uh, we, we, we provide the resources if we can, if the executive approves that, uh, and then the department has to carry that forward. So I'm not certain, uh, to be honest, what the hold-ups or difficulties have been there, and I think it would have to be the Minister for Communities who might uh, be able to provide you with an answer in relation to that. Supplementary question from Ms Barton. And, Minister, what are, I was going to follow on and ask, uh, have, you, have you any idea how many people were affected and the finance involved in that effect? Uh, well, unfortunately not, uh, not with me at the moment, but I can undertake to ask the Communities Department and provide the member with a written answer. I guess now here, Mr. Emma Sheeran for your question. I call Emma Sheeran for a question. Gormai, good last can call you. Minister, thanks for your answers thus far. The transgender community here are calling for a change in the law that allows people to declare their own gender identity rather than enduring a medical process requiring a medical declaration as is the current process. Do you agree with such a change? Uh, yes, I, I do. Uh, and I met with Transgender NI last year to talk through this issue and how best to bring about change here. Uh, unfortunately, there is not sufficient time left in this mandate to bring through such legislation. However, I have commissioned research to inform legislation in the next mandate. The research went out to tender in November last year, and unfortunately, no proposals were submitted. Therefore, it has been re-tendered with a closing date uh, of the 26th of February uh, this year. I very much encourage bids for this important work. Case Norlinta, again, Ms. Sheeran. Supplementary question for Ms. Sheeran. Gormaga, thanks, Minister, for that answer. Will the research that your department is conducting uh, refer to the 2015 bill in the 26 counties, currently the law? Uh, yes, uh, I'm conscious there's a shift internationally uh, uh, towards self declaration models of gender identity. So the research will examine the legislation south of the border as well. The fact that other jurisdictions have moved first means we can learn lessons from them. But it's also important that transgender people here are not left behind. So we do need to make progress on this in the next mandate. 
Here I'm Sir Mark Durkin for New Cash to call Mark Durkin for questions. Thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Is the Minister aware of how much money came here by way of Barnet Consequential for the youth labour market intervention called Kickstart in Britain, proposed as Job Start here, but now known as False Start, as it too has been shelved by the Minister for Communities after months of preparation by businesses and promises to young people? Well, I firstly can say that any money, any money which comes as a barn of consequences is up to the executive as a whole to decide what to do with it. Uh, so it's not for an individual department. It comes unhypothecated, as he will know from his time as a minister. He will also know as well that the programme hasn't been shelved, uh, but has run into the same difficulties as the ones he identified with employing people to deal with universal credit, uh, and that the department are very much concerned and desire to uh, press ahead with those employment support programmes. And again, it's a discussion we are having with the Minister for Communities, and again, it's an issue that we hope to address between now and the final budget paper. Mark Durkin, supplementary question for Mark. I thank the Minister for his answer, and I'm sure the Minister will agree with me, I think he already has, on the importance of upskilling our young people for employment and reskilling people of all ages, particularly given the employment abyss into which we are staring. Does he share my concerns that the impact that, that, that any failure to proceed with Job Start might have, combined with the impact on many employment and skills programmes uh, caused by the, the loss of European structural funds? Yes, I absolutely do agree with him, uh, particularly when, uh, as he mentioned in a previous question, the figures in terms of universal credit, the need to get people upskilled and reskilled and uh, to give some hope of employment to young people. Uh, so those, these programmes are hugely important, and that is why not only am I exercising trying to find support for the Minister for Communities, but we have pursued the issue of lost European funding. Uh, which the Department of Economy has a, it has a real impact there in terms of similar skills programmes. Uh, and so these are all going to be vitally important because we are going to face a significant economic downturn. We are going to, uh, already are facing uh, a significant increase in unemployment. Uh, and if we want to provide support for people to try and get them back into full employment, we need to assist them with skills uh, and, and re-education opportunities. Could we please bring uh, Colm Gildernew into the spotlight, please? And will to in Shin. And will Dunya be in Shin? Anybody there? Okay, here I'm Sir Colm Gildin for when you catch the court. I ask Colm Gildin you to ask a question. Minister, the pandemic has had a devastating impact on the fundraising activity of hospices. You have provided, I know, over 15 million of support to help hospices through this difficult period. Given the crucial role that these organisations play in caring for people with terminal illnesses, and given that there remains money to allocate this financial year, would you consider a further injection of financial support? Yes, I thank the member for his question. Uh, and can I say yes, as, as he has said, uh, we have provided uh, support for the hospices over the course of this year with the agreement from the Department of Health uh, and we are looking, currently looking at a further package uh, for the hospices uh, as part of some of the unspent COVID money we have to try and assist them and I, I very much as he does uh, and I'm sure all members in the House do value the services that the hospice provide and I was very glad that we were able to offer them some much needed support and we will uh, have been working with them to try and secure a further package for them. Okay, supplementary question for Colm Gildenew. Minister, and I know you have touched on this in a previous answer uh, during the session, but can I just can I just ask for further uh, expansion? As a representative in a rural community, I'm aware that this is a time of year financially when spare cash is often directed to improve roads, and we all continue, I'm sure, as have I today, even around roads in, in very poor condition. Would you be open to a bid for, for a further bid for roads maintenance, Minister? Uh, well, can I say I would. Uh, I, I, I know from my own experience as having responsibility for roads, the time is moving on. 
because generally speaking, the road services it was then would have been ready to go in January, February, and March. We're now approaching the end of February. Uh, but if should, such a bid uh, should arrive into the department and, and it's felt uh, because we had no bids in January monitoring for uh, roads maintenance or road improvements generally, but if such a bid should come in, I'd be very happy to consider that. But uh, I suspect that uh, time is against that now. Uh, but I'm happy to consider one of, if such a bid would come in. Okay, members, that ends topical questions for today. Uh, good Ira. Thank you, Minister. Um, we'll, if members just take their ease while we move back to the next item of business, which is a continuation of private members' business. Thank you.